Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Parm, and I'm a volunteer with the BC Bereavement Helpline. I am excited to introduce our speaker for today's event, Marnie Thompson. Marnie Thompson is a registered clinical counselor and currently the director of bereavement services at Victoria Hospice. Since 1994, she has worked in hospice palliative care, providing information, support, and counseling to patients, families, and healthcare providers. Marnie has co authored the award winning book. Transitions in Dying and Bereavement, a Psychosocial Guide for Hospice and Palliative Care. And she has co-authored an article published in the Journal of Loss and Trauma titled Complicated Grief in Canada, Exploring the Client and Professional Landscape. Marnie completed training at Columbia University Center for Complicated Grief and has since focused her teaching and clinical practice primarily in the field of grief and bereavement. In this presentation, Marnie will provide an overview of prolonged grief disorder. Included will be an introduction to the DSM diagnostic criteria, a review of risk factors, best practice approaches to treatment, and helpful resources. We are thrilled to have her speak today. Thank you, Marnie Thompson, for presenting on prolonged grief disorder. So to begin with, I would like to acknowledge that I am presenting today from Southern Vancouver Island, located in the traditional unceded territories of the Lekwungen, Malahat, Pachidat, Shaunu, Souk, and Wasonic peoples. With deep respect and humility, I wish to acknowledge that this is a privilege to live and work on these traditional lands and to gather here together seeking knowledge and community. As I join with you here today, I commit to walk softly on this land and to use my position and power to support Indigenous health and well being. So, today I'm going to be speaking about prolonged grief disorder. And I want to say that this is a very broad overview of disordered grief, including criteria and symptoms, some of the approaches to intervention and resources to extend your learning. I was trained in prolonged grief treatment by the Center for Complicated Grief, and that is my predominant lens, although this area has been a topic of interest of mine for at least the last decade, and I read widely in it, so I will share as much as I know. Uh, one or more of my slides come from presentations that the Center for Complicated Grief uh, uh, produces and you will see their logo on those particular slides and i've tried to include um, references on my slides as well, so that if anyone wants to look further. Um, you're welcome to explore those before I can teach about disordered grief it's always very important to me to begin with a baseline overview of grief generally it's important to I think underscore what grief is and what it isn't and how it works. To put it another way, before I speak about how grief can go awry for a very small percentage of bereaved people, it's important for me to talk about how it naturally unfolds for many of us. You will notice uh, from this slide uh, a picture of those different uh, face emojis, and they actually represent Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. It's always important to me when I'm presenting about grief to remind people that this stage model that Kubler-Ross developed was very important. I think it was seminal work in the field of death and dying and understanding how people approach death. But I want to make everyone aware that these stages were actually based on the experience of people who were approaching death. So they aren't actually uh, based on bereaved people's experience of grief, but on the experience of dying and end of life for people who are living with terminal illness. So I want to say as a reminder that grief is not a linear process. It's not from A to B. It's often for bereaved people very up and down and backwards and forwards. It's not orderly or predictable in the way that stage theories would like us to think. And also that the idea of acceptance, which is one of those five stages of grief, doesn't fit for many bereaved people. I think for lots of people who've lost someone fundamental, the idea of accepting that the death has happened just doesn't resonate. Uh, 
And the other thing that's important, I think, to say is that anger, as well as all kinds of emotions, isn't universal in grief, um, that people can feel a variety of feelings and not all feelings. And um, what one person feels in their grief might not be the same as someone else. And the other thing that's important to say is that I think grief is more than emotions. It includes our thoughts and our interactions with people and our habits and routines that grief really impacts us globally. So I always uh, have fun showing this slide because I think this is the most important thing for everyone to remember about the five stages of grief. And that is that there is no stage, there is no stage, et cetera. Just a reminder, Kubler-Ross's work was important. It helped us come a long way in our understanding of approaching end of life and dying, but it's not based on bereaved people and not helpful for those who are grieving. So what is grief? Grief is a natural, normal response to significant loss. As I said earlier, it's more than emotion. It's permanent. When we lose someone close, we will have feelings of grief about it for the rest of our lifetimes. That we can expect that for most of us, grief will adjust and adapt and shift over time. And that our grief is unique to each of us. So even within the same family, people might experience a loss differently, even though it was the same person who died. And also even within the same person that grief can be felt different from one loss to the next. The other thing that I think is really important as we get into talking later on about disordered grief, I think it's important to say all grief early on includes very naturally and normally preoccupation with thoughts about the person who died or about the nature of the death, about the events of the death, that it very normally includes that kind of longing and yearning and searching for the person who's died, a feeling of missing them intensely, um, that motions can be heightened and extreme at times. And again, very natural and normal when we've lost someone important to us. And that many people in the face of new loss kind of pull away from the routines of life, from their relationships, from their activities, uh, from their normal routines. And again, very typical and to be expected in early grief. So how I see the grief process and how I like to teach and talk about it is a, a kind of evolution from the time of the, the death, the, the time that we learn that the loss has occurred, followed up by a time of intense or acute grief where very often grief is our kind of main preoccupation. It's taking up a lot of space in our lives. And then over time, as we come to terms with the loss, as we learn to kind of adjust and uh, integrate that it's happened, it, it comes to a place of what we call integrated grief, where we've learned to live with it and we carry on forward. This slide uh, captures findings, I think, from a relatively new, new area of study in grief and loss, which is really aiming at trying to understand what is the course of grief for people over time? What can we expect? How does it go? And so this data talks about how we see that on the right-hand side of this pie chart, for most people, I'm gonna say it looks like 58% there, grief could be very intensely felt, high emotion and high intensity, or moderately felt, but decreasing over time. So we're seeing for the majority of people, we can feel and, and be very impacted by our grief, but over time that decreases. Then looking to the left-hand side of the pie chart, that sort of second lightest uh, wedge, we see that grief from about 33% of people is felt on a, a kind of low level. So it's there, but it's not intense. It's probably not interfering but it's stable, it doesn't get worse and it doesn't get better as time goes on. And then when we think about disordered grief and in particular prolonged grief disorder, you're looking at about 9% of, of grievers who experience that highly intense, highly distressing and disruptive kind of grief that remains high over time and isn't changing. I wanted to introduce this model for understanding grief because I think it's very helpful in terms of seeing all kinds of grief, whether it's the grief that most of us 
um, experience as we learn to adjust and live with loss or even in areas of that disordered grief. So this dual process model was put forward by a couple of uh, grief researchers, Strobe and Shoot. Um, there's been, it's been studied for many decades and, and they continue to produce new research about this. But I think what's important to understand as you're looking at this model is the two eggs, the blue egg and the green egg, really representing on the one side, the orientation to the loss, the meaning and consequences of it, how it feels and how it lives with us to have lost this person. And on the other side of the model, restoration orientation. And this is about the ways that the griever works toward rebuilding and reconstructing a life of meaning and purpose in the face of having experienced this loss. And what Strobe and Shoot are saying about this dual process model is that both elements of this model are important. We wanna be able to see grievers tending to their loss and how it feels, but also restoration. What about life ongoing? And in their, in their view, an indication of whether this person is going through an adaptive and, and, and healthy grief process is really about their ability to move back and forth between these orientations as needed. So time and space spent, spent feeling the loss and reflecting on what it means, and also still the capacity to carry on with life in some ways. It's important to know we're not looking for people to kind of 50% of their time is with loss orientation and 50% is restoration, but really the ability to kind of move fluidly back and forth as needed. This slide you'll see is branded from the Center for Complicated Grief. It comes from one of their presentations and I like it because it talks, I think, about that duality that many of us experience in the face of loss that's so important. So when someone who matters a lot to us dies, we're in pain. Our thoughts and feelings are confused, we're mixed up. We want the grief to go away, but we also wanna hold on to it. There's a real fear often in grieving people that if I'm not feeling about it, if I'm not impacted, if I'm not heavy with having lost this person, it would disappear. And what would that mean? What would that say about the importance of my person that I've lost? Another, I think, really common area of duality is on the one hand, knowing that the loss has happened, knowing that someone's died, but really having trouble taking it in. There's, a, I think, a really natural reflexive process in all of us that's just disbelieving. We don't want to, we don't want to know, we don't want to take in that this person is gone. And so that real like cognitively in my brain, I get it that this happened, but in my heart, I just don't want it to be true. And then the last bullet that I wanted to call out on this slide is that craving closeness to the person who died. So seeking, seeking connection with objects that remind them of the person who died with places that make us feel close to the person who died, but also very often protecting us, uh, protecting ourselves from those things exactly, having trouble with reminders that the person is gone or even reminders of the person in general. I want to say with this slide that I believe that grief is always an expression, a expression of separation distress. We are, we are aware that we've lost someone who matters a lot to us and we don't want it to be true. Sometimes there are elements of trauma related to the death or related to our relationship with the person, but trauma isn't necessarily a given. And that I also think grief really commonly includes levels of stress and anxiety. So why do we grieve? We're hardwired to want to be close to people. It's part of our psychobiology. We're made this way for our survival. When we care about someone deeply, we want to be with them and not separate from them. This survival instinct begins with us in utero before we're even born. It carries on through our infancy, childhood and adolescence, and even into our adulthood. One of the things that's important as we think about attachment theory that I think is um, really key when adults have experienced a loss is that we know that for adults, the caregiving aspect of relationships and closeness is just as important as the care receiving. So very often when someone dies, particularly after an illness, we've lost one of our really important ways to express that care for somebody, not just care received. And it makes me wonder if that's why so often bereaved people want to give back. They want to find a meaningful cause to volunteer with and, and to share their time and their experience. And I wonder if it's 
part of that caregiving function of attachment relationships. Why does attachment matter? Um, attachment matters because when we're in contact with the people we're close to, we feel better. Um, this may relate to how often we're yearning for someone after they've died. We want to be close to them, we're seeking them. And when we're suffering, we naturally seek proximity with those people that we're close to. And very often, I think when a death occurs, we're hurting, we're suffering, um, and we're turning to the people for comfort who may have been the people who've died. And so I think there's that sort of double isolation often after somebody dies. We know that relationships and attachments help us to regulate our physiology and also our psychologically. Psycho psychology. Again, we feel better when we're near and close with other people. So how grief impacts our relationships. When someone significant dies, we lose that important regulatory aspect of the relationship. Again, that feeling better when we're with people. Our close relationships provide us with champions when we take risks, cheerleaders when we succeed, and comfort when we fail or we're struggling. When a big loss or meaningful loss occurs, we often feel alone and isolated and overwhelmed. And again, sometimes the person we'd be turning to for comfort is the person who's died. Relationships provide us, again, in more psychological terms with a secure base, confidence to try on new and novel things, to take risks and to go out into the world. And then when those succeed or fail, there's that safe haven, the, the kind of champion function of the people who care about us, who see us out there taking risks and trying new things. And then importantly, provide us with comfort if they don't go well. Relationships help us psychologically. They help us um, to kind of feed our curiosity and our willingness to explore new things. They also help us to make decisions. Very often when we've got something that we're wrestling with, we take it to the people that we're close to and we say, I'm thinking about this, but I'm not sure. And we have that opportunity to share it with a trusted person. We actually are more kind of physiologically and psychologically calm when we're close with other people. They help us to um, feel more at peace and more settled within ourselves. And the last bullet that I really wanted to call out here is again, these attachment relationships, being close with people, helps us to be more comfortable with unknowns, helps us to cope with ambiguity or uncertainty. And when you think of someone who's grieving, there's a lot that's unknown. There's a lot that um, feels uncertain in the face of loss, losing someone primary. As we are tasked with relearning the world, more than ever, we need those close people who believe in us, who we know will cheer us on to take risks, who will lend us their confidence to borrow when we're not sure and comfort us if and when we fail. Relationships also help us physiologically. We sleep better when we're in connection with other people. Um, our ability to rest and eat and relax is more um, successful when we're near to the people that we're close to. And we know how important connection and contact with other people is for releasing that great uh, hormone oxytocin that we know helps us to lower our stress levels, lower that cortisol circulating in our body. So again, physiologically, being with other people helps us to feel better. And there's been some research, um, especially in the fields of palliative care around um, how our pain tolerance is better when we're with people that we're close to. So I'm gonna turn now in my presentation to talk more specifically about prolonged grief disorder. Over the past 10 years and more, I've been paying really close attention to the idea of disordered grief. And I've witnessed and engaged in what I believe has been a valuable discourse and necessary debate. And I'm also aware that that lack of clarity that we've had has made space for misinformation and confusion to circulate about what is disordered grief, what is prolonged grief disorder. And we've come through a time where uh, disordered grief has had many different names like complicated grief disorder, persistent complex grief disorder, pathological grief, sometimes traumatic or com complex grief. 
And I think this variety of names and diagnostic criteria has really been unfortunate because it's left people um, being missed who needed care and intervention differently than we would support other kinds of grief. Um, and also that sometimes uh, natural grief response, you know, that early acute intense grief has sometimes been misidentified as being disordered or prolonged grief disorder. So I'm always happy when I get to come together with others and talk about what is disordered grief specifically. So I like this infographic um, because I think it gives us a very simple visual diagram of grief in general that includes disordered grief, that includes some of the complexities that can come around when people experience a loss and all within the umbrella of all grief. So thinking back to um, earlier, the earlier slide about the, the kind of confusion and different names, I like that the darkest circle here is identifying prolonged grief disorder. It's within the realm of all grief and it's the smallest because it really is a small percentage of grievers who will experience prolonged grief disorder. And then we have the white circle with the bigger realm of complications that can happen in grief. Often these are contextual factors about the death itself or about the person who's grieving. This could include someone who's experienced multiple losses. It could be a person who has a prior history of trauma. It could be someone who's marginalized or maybe experiencing poverty. And it can also be about the nature of the death, that it was sudden or unexpected or accidental. But again, what I really want to emphasize here is whether we're talking about normal or complicated or prolonged grief, remember that this is all grief and it all needs support. Prolonged grief disorder, what is it? Prolonged grief disorder happens when someone loses someone close to them. So it happens following a death, when they experience intense yearning and longing for the person who died and very often are preoccupied with the person's death or with the person. And I think really importantly, it's, it's important to understand that prolonged grief disorder is really about a form of grief that lasts longer than would be expected socially or within someone's cultural context that causes distress and problems functioning to a disruptive degree. So very often people with prolonged grief disorder are really struggling in all or most realms of their life. And it's a kind of grief where very often they themselves would identify that they feel stuck. And it seems to extend beyond what would normally be expected. The American Psychological Association finally came to agreement about the, the name for disordered grief. So now we know it will be called prolonged grief disorder. It was officially accepted into the, the DSM in September of last year and will be included in, in the edition that's coming out this month. I think it's important to understand again, when we're talking about prolonged grief disorder, it really involves profound and global disruption of the person's life beyond what would be seen socially or culturally as normal. The diagnostic criteria includes a number of areas to consider here. So anyone with prolonged grief disorder is, has experienced the death of a person at least 12 months ago. So we wouldn't be diagnosing someone as having prolonged grief disorder if it were less than 12 months since the death occurred. That diagnosis is different for children and adolescents where the cutoff uh, duration of time is six months. So a person needs to meet criterion A, it's a death and it happened 12 months ago. Criterion B also has to be met that the person is experiencing intense pervasive grief and longing and preoccupation for the person who died. The middle criterion C, a person has to experience at least three of these eight indicators to a clinically significant degree nearly every day for at least the past month. So we're not talking about a person who's had an intensely bad day. We're talking about a bad day for many days and most of the days in a month. And I'm going to talk about these eight criterion in the next slide. 
Criterion D, so as I was talking about earlier, significant distress or impairment in all areas of the person's life. So their personal relationships, including family and friends, their school life, if they're a student, their employment and work life, their daily routines, really all of them kind of globally impaired by this loss. And then, as I was saying earlier, that the duration, so the length of time this person's been grieving and the intensity of that grief clearly exceeds what would have been normally expected from that person's social, cultural, or religious context. Some of the common symptoms of prolonged grief disorder, I think were important to have in mind. These are those eight qualities from the criterion C. And I want you to keep in mind, you'd need to see at least three of these in somebody intensely for at least the last month. So by identity disruption, we're talking about a person feeling like, I don't know who I am anymore since this loss has happened. That disbelief or having trouble accepting or integrating that the death has happened. An avoidance of reminders of the person who died or the death itself. Intense emotional pain. Difficulty moving forward, and I would say even difficulty imagining the future. Kind of at the other end of intense emotion, sometimes people with um, prolonged grief disorder are emotionally numb. They're not feeling much of anything. Often a sense that life is meaningless or worthless now that the loss has occurred. And intense loneliness, a feeling of kind of being separate from relationships that once felt meaningful and important, kind of like the world is going on without me and I'm not part of it. The prevalence of prolonged grief disorder, most of the meta-analysis of studies of prolonged grief would say that it lands somewhere in the neighborhood of, I would say, 9 to 11% of bereaved people will experience prolonged grief disorder. We know that these uh, rates are likely higher in populations of bereaved people who've experienced a violent death or a sudden death, such as an accident, a suicide, or a homicide, or a natural disaster. I wonder what we're gonna see, and there's some early studies about the pandemic and how that's impacting prolonged grief disorder. But I also feel like it's always very important in our world and in our country, in this province of BC where I'm coming from, to talk about the impact of toxic drug deaths and, and the grief that those um, family members and friends are experiencing. I think we would see higher incidences of prolonged grief disorder in that population as well. So who will develop prolonged grief disorder? Where is it gonna show up? Um, there are a number of different studies about this. And I think some, some kind of big umbrellas to focus on are that there are certain demographic characteristics that we see with people um, who develop prolonged grief disorder, uh, a, a history of pre-existing mental health conditions. As I was saying earlier, the nature of the death, particularly if it's violent or uh, unexpected, I think we see more incidences of prolonged grief disorder and a lack of community around that bereaved person, that very often those with prolonged grief disorder um, have difficult connections with friends and family and don't feel adequately supported in their grief. So even though in the next slides, I'm gonna talk about who develops prolonged grief disorder, it's really important to me to emphasize that we need to be careful about the assumptions we make about who will develop prolonged grief disorder. It really could be any person with any type of loss. In my 30 years of grief counseling, I've supported people who had disordered grief, who were mothers, who were fathers, who were adult children, who were friends and partners, who had lost people to long illnesses over many years, and then of course, sudden deaths as well. So I think it's really important for us to be careful of our assumptions. Some of the demographic characteristics that are showing up with people in people with prolonged grief disorder, more often women uh, than men, more often people of an older age, and by older age, that is 60 plus. So me nearing close to 60, that doesn't necessarily feel older age, but again, more prolonged grief disorder showing up with people older, and also people of lower socioeconomic status. I think we need to see more research in this area. I think there is some bias in the research around um, older populations that are maybe easier to research 
I wonder how much grief we would see in more marginalized populations. I wonder about prolonged grief disorder in LGBTQ populations, in areas where there's more poverty, in different uh, racialized communities. So I think there's more to know about demographic characteristics. We also are seeing more disordered grief in people with a history of mental illness, in particular mood disorders like bipolar disorder and depression. More often prolonged grief in people who have a history of childhood adversity, um, those early childhood experiences of abuse or neglect or addiction, very often um, more prevalent in people with disordered grief. And the other thing that I think is important to pay attention to is if depression is, is a new and noted feature of a person early in their grief, so soon after the loss, there's some research now showing that that depression showing up is a, a kind of warning sign and indicator for per, potentially developing prolonged grief down the road. As I've talked about earlier, probably no surprise, the nature of the death is impacting how people experience disordered grief. So obviously troubling characteristics related to the nature of the death, such as deaths that are unexpected, that are violent, where there's harm to the body of the person who died, um, where family members or bereaved people are concerned that their loved one suffered or was alone or felt frightened. Um, in terms of the nature of the death, the lack of opportunity to say goodbye and thinking of that, I think of our pandemic and how often people have died separate from their family members. And again, as I was saying earlier, I think toxic drug deaths are also a population that we need to pay attention to for prolonged grief disorder. And lastly, in inadequate uh, social support. I do have a reference here that talks about this, but I will say anecdotally from my work with bereaved people over the years, almost everyone that I saw having trouble with either complicated or disordered grief had poor or disrupted early attachment relationships. So real challenges in their growing up life. They had higher than usual um, adverse childhood experiences and also histories of mental illness, such as depression, addiction, and neglect. Often estrangements with core family members and few friendships to turn to for support. So treatments for prolonged grief disorder, I want to just say this is not exhaustive, um, what I'm going to talk about in terms of interventions, but includes one of the treatments that I'm the most experienced and trained in, and all others that I think are clinically compelling. I think these are very early days in our understanding of what is best practice for people with prolonged grief disorder, although many as a, of us have been working well with grief for many years. This 9% of people who experienced a kind of disordered grief, I think we've got more to learn. But even so, as I talk about these very, I, I think, technical interventions, I want to underscore that we don't forget about the importance of companionship, of therapeutic alliance, of being a good grief companion. Sometimes listening and presence are the most of what somebody needs in their grief. So in this slide, I'm introducing three, four research papers that talk about interventions for prolonged grief. Some of them are old enough that they were still calling it complicated grief disorder, um, but I, I think relevant and appropriate. The one uh, study in the top right that I've got a blue box around is the treatment approach that I was trained in. Um, in 2012, I was invited to be part of a pilot project at the Center for Complicated Grief at Columbia University where a number of us around the world were trained in this evidence-based approach to disordered grief. Um, it has proven uh, in multiple research studies to be um, efficacious and helpful to people with prolonged grief disorder. So I want to highlight that and I will talk about it some more. Underneath that blue box slide, um, there's a woman named Birgit Wagner uh, in Europe who has been doing an internet-based writing intervention for people with complicated grief. It uses a lot of the principles of the treatment program that I was trained in, but through writing online with people who have uh, struggling with their grief. On the top left hand corner, I'm calling out this study because it's a CBT approach and I want to say that many of the interventions for prolonged grief include some kind of um, cognitive behavioral aspects to the treatment. 
This one I, I've highlighted because it's focused on children and adolescents and I think is, is really worth reading for anybody who supports um, young kids. And the last one on the bottom left is a present centered therapy for prolonged grief disorder. It's something that I hadn't heard of or thought about until I read it. And I, I think it's new and novel and worth studying because it doesn't so much focus on um, talking about the death and the loss experience. It's much more about um, building therapeutic alliance between the clinician and the bereaved person and and focusing on what are the ways that grief is interfering with their lives and how to problem solve and move forward from there. Yeah. So prolonged grief disorder treatment, as I was trained, is an evidence-based proven effective treatment for prolonged grief disorder that builds on attachment theory. And I spoke at length early on about the importance of attachment relationships it really supports and uses the dual process model of coping with grief and also uses interventions and techniques from interpersonal therapy and CBT and also motivational interviewing. So how some of the interventions for prolonged grief disorder treatment um, fit with the dual process model. Here you see on the left side, I've got loss focused interventions and restoration focused ones. So that treatment that I was trained in uses the grief monitoring diary where the bereaved person is tracking every day um, the highs and lows of their grief and what's going on at that time, really helping them to notice when is it better, when is it worse and what's going on. We spend a lot of time confronting avoidance. So um, picking things that the bereaved person are feeling like they're avoiding and really working at breaking down some of that avoidance, talking about the person who died and talking about the death. On the restoration side, um, encouraging the bereaved person to share memories and stories about the person who died, but also I think really importantly to focus on a goal or an aspiration that's completely unrelated to the death. So again, kind of focusing on rebuilding and reconstructing a meaningful life and also building relationships with support people. Here's an overview of a typical prolonged grief disorder treatment session. At the beginning, there's sort of a, here's what we're doing today and setting of the agenda. Time is spent focusing on the loss and the, the feelings and meaning attached to that, but also time every session on restoration. So what are the aspirations? How are they doing with goals? How is that building of a support person and relationship? And then a review of what's happened and what's to come in the next week. Enter the global pandemic. And this comes to nearing the end of my presentation where um, I think the pandemic has made grief much harder. And I think of not just the COVID-19 pandemic, but really the epide epidemic of toxic drug supply in our country and around the world. So this is the COVID-19 dashboard from Johns Hopkins University Hospital. It shows on a daily basis how many people have died from COVID. And I think important to notice on this slide, we're now at a point where over 6 million people worldwide have died for COVID-related causes. And in Canada, over 37,000 people. More deaths, of course, equal more grief. And during the time of the pandemic, a group of researchers at a university in Pennsylvania developed a bereavement multiplier where they were able to calculate for each death that happens, how many people are impacted, how many people are bereaved. And the outcome of that study was that for every one death, nine people are grieving. And on the right hand side, this COVID-19 grief counter is on the Canadian Grief Alliance's homepage, and it's tracking the number of, of Canadians that are bereaved following a death during the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, a reminder about the number of deaths that we're experiencing due to toxic drugs supply and, and overdose. We cannot and must not ignore the health crisis and public health emergency that began long before the COVID pandemic and continues to take lives in our province and country. Social distancing and social isolation contradict the advice given to keep people who use drugs safe. Faced with a difficult choice related to pandemic restrictions, they're using alone and risk death from overdose more than ever. Headlines indicate that we've had more people die from toxic drug 
poisoning than COVID in our province of BC. So besides targeted treatment, besides those sophisticated interventions, what can we be doing to help people with disordered grief? And very basically, be a good grief companion. Keep in mind that bereaved persons may have lost their main support, the person that they would turn to for comfort and reassurance. So foster those connections, be one of those people or support people to build those relationships for themselves. Encourage meaningful activities and recognize that that might be an experiment at first, that very often when someone have lost people close, they can't imagine what would be meaningful or enjoyable anymore. So support uh, curiosity and experimentation. Talk about the person who died, invite conversation about them. Remember those important dates of the death date, but also birthdays and mother's days and other uh, dates through the year that might be important. Don't at all underestimate the importance of presence and coming alongside people in their grief. It really is, I think, the most fundamental and important tool that we have. Some of the resources that I think are important for people who want to know more about prolonged grief disorder or study more, the Center for Prolonged Grief at Columbia University, where I, where I trained, offers trainings online. They've got tools and handouts and webinars. They also list all the research that they've done in the past and continue to do. So that's an excellent resource for both professionals and the public. They've got different pages um, for both. Uh, Canadian Virtual Hospices, mygrief.ca has a lot of information about grief in general, and they're about to launch some specific modules about prolonged grief disorder. So watch out for those. And then the last resource I wanted to mention, the end of life program at Cornell University has a self-assessment tool so that you can point people who are wondering about their grief uh, to this online self-assessment where people can anonymous, anonymously fill out a questionnaire and based on their score, get some feedback around what might be needed in terms of support in their grief. This last slide is my contact information and I just want to underscore at any time, I would be happy to be approached to have more conversations about this topic. It is very close to my heart and I'm happy uh, to continue to teach and learn with others. So please reach out if you have questions. Thank you very much. Take care out there. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining in today to learn some things about prolonged grief disorder. I've got a couple of questions that I'm looking forward to responding to and just want to invite anyone who's here to um, continue putting forward some questions for me to respond to. We've got a little time. So the first question that I was asked is, are there any other disorders or environments that may make one more likely to experience prolonged grief? And I've been thinking about that. And one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking from my clinical practice is um, people on the autism spectrum, people with autism spectrum disorder. And most importantly about that, um, the, the ability to kind of access and receive support, um, you know, to communicate needs and, and access support from people um, because isolation is a really, I think key factor in experiencing and suffering from prolonged grief disorder. And so um, I wonder about folks on the autism spectrum and their supports and resources around them. Um, I also was thinking the pandemic itself I, is an environment that we're in that I think will predispose um, some of us to uh, developing prolonged grief disorder. Uh, again, the, the isolation and the challenges around the way that deaths have happened and the lack of access to um, community, both for kind of the formal rituals like funerals and memorials, but also just uh, accompanying each other, just spending time together uh, when we're grieving. I, I wonder about those. And then in terms of environments also, I think, or, or things that predispose people to perhaps developing prolonged grief disorder, um, I, I think of people whose um, other more primary, basic, fundamental needs are not met, 
So people who are not living in a safe environment, who don't have access to um, stable housing and um, economics and resources, I, I think those kinds of things where there are kind of more overarching fundamental needs that aren't met um, would certainly predispose people to disordered grief. And I also think delayed grief, you know, when, when um, basic survival needs aren't being met, that that can take the place of um, time and space to process loss. So I wonder about those folks. If the person who asked that has other thoughts or more questions, I would love you to kind of push me along to say more. Um, there's another question here, someone saying this could be a large topic, but would I outline some of the perceived pros and cons to the diagnosis being added to um, the diagnostic and statistical manual as a disorder? So pros and cons about prolonged grief being identified as a disorder. And I guess I want to say I, I'm glad this was asked because it, it is a huge um, maybe less so now debate, but discussion uh, in the clinical community, but also I think in the public, there's concern that um, we would be calling any kind of grief when anybody's struggling um, as disordered or pathological. And um, there's, I think, a, a really understandable and legitimate worry about that. But what I wanna say as a longtime grief counselor and clinician and educator is I think as a culture, as a world, um, we have a very limited uh, understanding of grief, what it is and what it looks like and how it lives with people. And, and related to that, really poor skills for supporting bereaved people. And so while I would like to see our level of understanding and comprehension and capacity to care for grieving people in general grow, um, I think there's a real need for us to get clear about what is disordered grief. And, and in that, I guess I want to underscore, we're not talking about anybody who's having a difficult time. Um, we're not talking about people who are intensely sad or struggling in the face of their loss. Um, there is a place for those feelings and that struggle that is real, I think, for any of us when we lose someone important. But when we're talking about disordered grief, it is again, this very small percentage of people who experience loss, who months later and years later are not really able to kind of return to life. They're not able to engage fully with their lives, that life doesn't hold meaning or purpose or value anymore to a degree that really not much else is going on. So I think it's important to, um, for me, I would say celebrate that we've finally come to consensus about what is disordered grief, that we are, I think, getting better at coming to one name for it now, prolonged grief disorder instead of persistent complex bereavement disorder or complicated grief, that the people who've studied this for many years have come to clarity around the language for it, and also that we've got a very clear criteria set. And I think if we encourage practitioners and people struggling with their grief to really look to that criteria set to decide and determine and identify who may have disordered grief, then we won't get into some of the real worry uh, uh, concerns that are out there that everyone's going to be uh, identified as having disordered grief or not doing grief right um, if they're feeling things intensely and struggling. That if we go to that criteria set, it will really help us to better um, have a greater understanding, to do better research and education, to develop um, new and improved treatment approaches, and also that people will have more access to the treatment that they need. So while I recognize there is a fear that there's concern that we're going to develop a pill for grief, um, that bereaved people who are struggling might be uh, blamed for not doing grief right. I think if we encourage clinicians and people grieving to really look clearly at what that criteria set is, um, it, it really is good news. I'm seeing um, another question here. If we suspect someone has experienced prolonged grief, how can we best support them? I think there are a number of things that we can do. I think as a 
as a friend and companion uh, alongside someone who's struggling in their grief, one of the most important things that you can do is to keep showing up um, beyond kind of the first weeks and when we typically would have had a funeral to keep checking in on that bereaved person to invite dialogue about the person who died to say, hey, you know, I think this was your mom's birthday. Are you doing anything special? Do you want some company? Um, to really be willing to lean into somebody's experience of their grief and ask about it, to hear about it and to just listen. And it's less important, I think, when you're uh, accompanying someone in their grief to have all the best answers, as much as it is to be willing to kind of tolerate their struggle and their pain and to hear it and to be interested in it. I think to encourage people to connect with bereavement resources in their communities through in BC, we have the BC Bereavement Helpline, but also hospice societies, um, the Center for Prolonged Grief at Columbia University has all kinds of excellent resources for people. So I think those are some of the important things to look to. I'm seeing someone ask, will we be able to watch this again? And my understanding is that this will live on YouTube uh, going forward. So yes, absolutely, you could watch it again. You can point people to it. Um, I, I think it will be underneath the BC Bereavement Helpline's um, YouTube site. I've got another question from Cliff here. I wonder how grief and prolonged grief, as we've been discussing, is affected by what's happening with climate change and we witness species of other forms dying off. Ooh, that's a fantastic question. I wish I, wish I was more of a scientist, Cliff, because I think there are some things to think about there. Um, just going to reflect and see if anything comes forward for me. You know, Cliff, I'm going to say I, I think it's I think it's outside of my realm, but you know, one of the things that I would say as a person who's worked in palliative care and end of life care for a long time is just the importance of noticing, um, noticing death and noticing dying. Um, of course, not only in humans, but also in plant life and animal life around us, and and certainly climate change will have a big impact on that. So. I think learning not to look away and become indifferent to suffering and struggling and end of life forms, I, I think would be really important. But I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sophisticated enough yet in my thinking to think about climate change and, and prolonged grief disorder, but I really appreciate it. And I'd love to hear Cliff, if you've got some more thoughts on that. Anyone else here still that has something we could talk about in a little more detail? Okay, I think we've heard from everybody that we can in the time that we have. And um, on behalf of the BC Bereavement Helpline, I wanna say thank you so much for inviting me uh, to come and to talk with you today about prolonged grief disorder. I hope that we all have a little bit better understanding of what it is and what to do with it. And um, my thanks also, especially to the BC Bereavement Helpline for inviting me today. Take care out there, everybody.